So as my, my end, I'm going to be talking about the importance of water, um, healthy weight loss, and also healthy weight gain. Okay. Um, so in my presentation, I'll be going through the importance of a healthy environment, the importance of nutrition. Um, I will go over the macronutrients, um, athlete body types and nutritional needs, superfoods, foods to avoid, the importance of water, um, the dangers of weight cutting, and the effects of dehydration. Okay. Um, so, um, the importance of a healthy environment. So the environment that an athlete trains in is very important and will have an effect on the athlete's performance and how successful an athlete will be in his or her career. Um, if you're an athlete and want to live a long and healthy Muay Thai career, um, be sure to take these points into consideration. Um, the mental health of an athlete is a very important topic of interest these days amongst the IOC Athletes Commission and amongst um, health practitioners in general. So while mental toughness is a very valuable attribute to have in our sport, um, you have to understand that too much pressure can actually hinder one's performance. Um, and if you're a coach, you need to understand this as well too. So especially during these times of COVID when there is so much change and uncertainty, um, it's important to keep your athletes supported. Um, so the next point um, that is athlete entourage. Um, so entourage support is also very important. Coaches um, and entourage play a pivotal role in an athlete's career and success. Um, is the coach's role to be there for the athlete, to educate and guide them. And if they cannot be there um, to do this, then they should ensure that somebody else, um, they should ensure that there is someone else an athlete can turn to when times get tough. As athletes, you need to be aware of this too. Um, so Muay Thai is as much a team sport as it is an individual sport. Um, ensure that you have at least someone to count on when times get tough because when you're aiming for the top, uh, the sacrifice and the commitment can be taxing and it's always comforting to have that one, two or a few people that you can count on to be there and support you during um, your hardships and also your success. Your success. Studies show that athletes who are more supported are less likely to make bad decisions um, when under extreme stress and pressure. Um, so examples of this um, could be uh, saying no to a friend or offering a prohibited substance because the athlete is under pressure to win um, or taking a prohibited medication in an attempt to speed up the healing process of an injury. Um, all these scenarios are not unrealistic. If you're an athlete, um, Find someone you can trust, um, and if you have any questions, um, make sure that you get those questions answered. Um, it is your responsibility as athletes to ensure that you're educated um, and also that you can get the right answers um, if you have any questions. Um, prevention is key because one small mistake can, uh, like taking a prohibited substance can lead to an anti-doping violation. Um, and this can cost you four years. So that's four years. Um, depending on how old you are, this can often end a athlete's career. So you want to make sure that you know what's going into your body, you're aware of um, the prohibited substance on WADA's uh, page um, so that you are educated in your decisions. Um, the importance of uh, life balance. I'm probably one of the most guilty of not having the most life balance, but I have suffered, and I have suffered the effects of this as an elite athlete. Um, sometimes an elite athlete, we have very uh, crazy schedules. So I oftentimes athletes work, um, they go to school, um, they have really long training hours, um, so it can be taxing. 
Um, I know what it feels like um, if you don't have time for yourself because you have so many responsibilities um, and these responsibilities are pulling you in, in various directions. But you must realize um, that you need your me time and coaches also have to realize this too um, or else the athlete will run the risk of burning out um, and compromising their hormonal or immune systems. Um, as a long-term effect of neglecting this important aspect. So while it is common to have an unbalanced life when training, for example, for world championships or a fight, um, because the focus is on training, um, ensure that after the fight, um, you take a few days off to recuperate, um, enjoy the things that you love, whatever that may be, so you can come back to training stronger and more refreshed. So the next one, we're gonna talk about the importance of nutrition. So if you think about how many times you eat in a day, so breakfast, lunch, dinner, and snacks, um, maybe that would take about three hours out of your day, um, out of a 12 hour day. So that's about 25% of your day. So taking this ratio into consideration, um, it's wise to ensure that you put some thought into what you're putting into your body. So food provides energy for your daily activities and training. It provides essential vitamins and minerals to sustain recovery and repair. Um, it provides the building blocks for hormones, which are, the essential, which are essential for the communication in the body. Proper nutrition becomes increasingly um, important for elite athletes, for energy, to carry out their daily activities, for development. Um, the hormones in the body are the communication tools. Um, nutrition provides or supports growth and repair, um, and also proper rest and recovery is essential to prevent injury. Um, additional energy requirements for athletes' or performance are um, required and proper nutrition uh, allows for ener energy for training and competition. Failure to meet these requirements may result in fatigue, um, failure to perform, injury, and muscle loss. So I'm going to go over very briefly um, what each macronutrient does um, so that you have a a foundation of where you can make your choices with respect to um, planning out your, your own diets. So macronutrients. The macronutrients are the building blocks um, for the body. They are fats, protein, um, and carbohydrates. So the function of carbohydrates, they provide energy. Um, the types of carbohydrates are simple carbohydrates, which are broken down quickly and can be used as a fast energy source, uh, and complex carbohydrates. So these ones are broken down slowly, and they're used for sustained energy. So these are in important to incorporate in like the, the main meals, such as breakfast, lunch, and dinner so that you have that sustained energy throughout the day and throughout training. Uh, simple carbohydrate examples include sugary sports drinks, fruit juice, table sugar, ice cream, muffins, and bagels. Complex carbohydrate examples include fruits and vegetables, uh, whole grains, legumes, uh, whole grain breads, and pastas. Proteins. Uh, Proteins function are to repair cells and muscle. Um, they are incorporated in when used by the body to create enzymes, hormones, neurotransmitters, and antibodies. Sources of proteins include lean meats, chicken, beef, fish, turkey, eggs, and plant protein sources include, include legumes, uh, peas, tofu, tempeh, spirulina, chlorella, hemp hearts, nuts, and seeds. The purpose of fats, um, fats are used in metabolism. Uh, they help with cell signaling. They support body tissue. Uh, 
they are incorporated with respect to building the immune system, um, they're involved in hormone production, and they're also used in the absorption of many nutrients. So as you can see, um, there are a lot of uh, vitamins that require fats in order to be absorbed by the body and used by the body. Kinds of fats um, are monounsaturated fats and polyunsats. Uh, Omega-3 and 6 fatty acids are examples of polyunsaturated fats. Um, and another source of healthy fats are saturated fats. Um, saturated fats are animal fats. Uh, they do get a bad rap and you shouldn't have too much of them, but they are required in the body. Unhealthy fats include trans fatty acids and hydrogenated fats. Um, these fats are unhealthy for the body and are toxic because they are man-made. When your body goes to digest them, um, it doesn't really know what to do because it doesn't recognize it. And so inflammation, heart disease results because your body can't get rid of it and it builds up as toxin, as a toxin. So try and stay away from trans fatty acids and hydrogenated fats. So now that we know a little bit about the basics of the different food groups, um, let's learn about different body types and hopefully you can pinpoint your specific body type and your goal so that you have an idea of what, you, what portion of each food group or what macronutrient, um, what the portion should look like. Um, in the end, it's all about portioning and the type of foods you choose for your body and whether or not your body is receiving the right amount of macronutrients is very important. Um, just a disclaimer, these are just guidelines. There is no cookie cutter recipe for fighters um, as everybody is different. So you can start with these guidelines and adjust accordingly to how you feel uh, with respect to your energy or um, improvement in performance. Um, and if weight loss or weight gain is a goal of yours, um, just be aware and take note after a couple weeks. So um, the first body type is an ectomorph. So as you can see in the picture, uh, Generally, ectomorphs are lean um, with a small, um, taller. Uh, they can also be uh, smaller um, and they often have thinner limbs. They have fast metabolism and tolerate carbs well. Um, and they're either usually trying to gain muscle or support endurance exercises. Um, so this is an example of an ectomorph meal. So for males, you would, I love this um, method because it uses your own body parts. Uh, your body parts are proportional to the size of your body. Um, so this is why I love this method and it's super easy. So for males, um, you're going to start with two palm sizes of protein-dense foods, two fifths of vegetables, uh, one cup or, ten, or three cups full of sizes of carbs and one thumb of fat. For females, you're going to use one palm size of protein, one fist of vegetables, two cupped handfuls of carb dense foods, and half a thumb uh, size dense of, uh, of fat dense foods. So if you're an ectomorph, um, I really feel for you. Uh, oftentimes with respect to athletes, um, I've experienced this in, in North America where um, most of the people are a lot bigger. Um, in Asia, you have a lot of smaller fighters. So I don't think you have too much trouble with respect to, for example, um, fighting fighters in the weight class of like 100 pounds and, and under. Um, but oftentimes these athletes have a really hard time uh, finding, I guess, competitors in their weight class, so they often try and gain a little bit of weight so that they have, they can have a more active, um, competitive, I guess, lifestyle. Um, so as an ectomorph, if you're trying to gain weight, you're trying to gain muscle, you really have to work on increasing your calories. Uh, and one trick that I love is uh, using smoothies, so you can often uh, incorporate a lot of vegetables, 
a lot of um, vitamin and mineral dense foods into smoothies um, and to incorporate and to get that kind of boost in caloric intake that you need to, to gain your muscle and, and that extra weight. Um, so having a pre-workout smoothie, maybe an hour, maybe two hours before, it just depends on how you, how fast you metabolize it. Um, and also having um, a smoothie after uh, will help to increase your caloric, caloric intake and even for snacks as well. So the next body type is mesomorph. Uh, they're generally athletic looking, uh, medium sized frame. They gain muscle and stay lean easy. Um, they're usually trying to optimize physique or boost sport performance. So again, if you look at the portion sizes of the macronutrients, two um, palm sizes for males, two fifths for uh, vegetables, uh, two cup handfuls of carbs, Sorry guys, somebody's trying to call me. <laughs> and two thumb uh, sizes of fat dense foods. For females, uh, one palm size of protein, uh, one fist of uh, vegetables, one couple of carbohydrates, and one thumb size, uh, dense, one thumb size uh, of fat dense foods. Um, if you're an endomorph, generally you have a large frame, um, you're heavier than most, uh, you have a slower metabolism and you don't tolerate, tolerate carbs well. You're usually trying to lose fat um, and support strength. So for endomorphs, you're going to start with two palm size uh, portions of protein dense foods, two fists of vegetables, one cup handful of carb dense foods, three thumbs of fat, and for females, one palm size portion of uh, protein dense foods, one fifth size of vegetables, half a cup of car or half of a handful of carbs, and two uh, thumbs of fat. So um, for endomorphs or for people who want to lose weight, um, as stated in the slide, uh, you generally don't tolerate carbs well. So you want to reduce the amount of carbs. And so if you reduce the amount of carbs, um, if you remember from the slides about the function of carbohydrates is to um, provide you with energy. So if you're reducing the amount of foods that provide you energy, you need another energy source, and that would be fats. So you need to increase your fats a little bit. So it's all about portioning and kind of um, using the foods that your body will tolerate the best. Oftentimes, um, I think people, uh, carbs have a, no, fats have a bad rap. And they think that if you eat, of course, if you eat a lot of fats, it's not good for you. Um, but I think they don't eat any fats at all. And um, it's a, it's a, it's kind of misleading because you're, as mentioned in the slides about uh, the function of fats, um, fats have a lot of function in the body. So you want to make sure that um, you're getting adequate amount of fats and enough energy so that, especially for elite athletes um, who are very active. So we're going to get into, I'm going to give you guys a cheat. Um, and this is really cool because there, I'm going to give you um, some examples of superfoods. So superfoods are really great because um, there are foods that contain a wide array, wide array of essential micronutrients and are high in quantities of vitamins and minerals. So it has all the fuels and the, um, the building blocks your, your body needs um, in order to function properly.
Um, they contain very potent and unique compounds that are often healing. So this is really important for, especially for um, Muay Thai athletes, when you can endure a lot of wear and tear. So how do you prefer, prepare superfoods? So you want to make sure that you don't overheat them, and you want to combine them with other foods to receive the most nutrients. So for example, um, you're going you're gonna to combine or iron-rich superfoods with vitamin C. So for example, uh, an example of an iron-rich superfood is lentils. So you might want to have a lentil salad. And to incorporate some vitamin C, you could make a really nice salad dressing using some freshly squeezed orange juice. So there you have like a really good combination which will allow you to absorb as many nutrients from um, the superfoods as possible. You're going to combine green superfoods with healthy fats. So again, you can do another salad um, using olive oil and say, for example, spinach. Um, you're going to combine super spices with a fat source. So a way that you can do this is, for example, curries. Curries often have coriander, they often have turmeric, um, which are really great spices or superfood spices. And um, often these uh, curries have some sort of a fat source. So for example, coconut milk or even ghee. So there are um, an array of uh, a variety of ways which you can eat healthy um, and have uh, nutrient dense foods, but also in, ensure that you, you have like healthy and good tasting foods as well. So eating healthy doesn't have to be boring. So here's a list of superfood macronutrient examples. Um, these are protein superfoods, so lean, meat, lean red meats, uh, grass-fed preferred, salmon, uh, eggs, plain Greek yogurt, cottage cheese, coconut milk, yogurt, uh, quark, and protein supplements, whey milk, or plant protein sources. So with supplements, I just want to make a disclaimer. Um, oftentimes supplements don't have the same degree of, or they're not they don't have to be FDA approved. And so um, they can contain, sometimes contain prohibited substance. You wanna be very wary when you um, are incorporating supplements into your diet. Um, the best way to incorporate nutrients is to have natural foods. Um, but if you do incorporate supplements, make sure that um, they don't contain prohibited substances or even go as far as um, calling the manufacturer and just kind of asking them about the process in which they make the supplements. Um, carbohydrate superfoods include spinach, tomatoes, cruciferous vegetables, mixed berries, oranges, um, beans, peas, other legumes, quinoa, and whole oats. Fat superfoods include raw unsalted mixed nuts, avocados, olive oil, coconut oil, sesame oil, fish oil, and ground flax seeds. Fo foods to avoid and limit. Um, so there's just here are just a few examples of foods that you want to try to avoid. Um, the first one is coffee, and I know there are a lot of coffee drinkers out there. I am also a coffee drinker. Um, I'm not saying that you have to um, eliminate at all, but I do want to uh, let you know how you can enjoy coffee um, in moderation um, and also uh, ensure that it doesn't have a, a bad effect on your absorption of nutrients. So for example, coffee inhibits the uptake of retinol and beta carotene, which are really um, important vitamins for your eyes. Iron, which helps in the, um, the uptake of oxygen into your blood. B-complex vitamins, which um, helps with your energy, so it's your source of energy. Choline, which is important for brain function, um, and, and potassium. So potassium is used uh, when your muscles are moving um, and when you're when you're flexing and when you're punching and everything. So you want to make sure that you limit your uptake of coffee. If you do enjoy coffee, um, ensure that you have it away from food. So like 
um, it's listed. Coffee inhibits the uptake of a lot of things. Um, it requires, uh, when caffeine is digested, uh, it requires a lot of nutrients to get rid of the caffeine. So if you're going to have coffee, have it away from food. So maybe 15 minutes before you eat or an hour or two um, in between meals. Genetically modified foods. Um, so genetically modified foods are, are bad for you because um, they increase immune cells. I think this is why the, you see a lot of um, allergies these days because there are a lot of genetically modified foods out there. Um, in some research papers, uh, there has been extensive organ damage in lab animals and livestock fed genetically modified feed. Uh, increases the risk of cancer um, and contains a lot of toxins at the molecular level. So for example, Monsanto is a big um, company that uh, it, they uh, make these genetically modified seeds and they sell them to farmers. Um, this company also produces uh, genetic um, pesticides, and so, for example, of how crazy these um, organisms are, is the farmers are required to uh, purchase these fertilizers or these pesticides in order for these seeds to grow because they have um, because there's no other way that these seeds can grow. So oftentimes at the molecular level, um, they contain a lot of toxins, which are really bad for your body. Foods with preservatives. So a lot of cheeses, unfortunately, um, and cold cuts, uh, preserved meats, uh, and also packaged foods. They have a lot of preservatives, nitrites, sulfites, sodium benzoate, propanoic acid, they can cause um, reactions for asthma, allergies, um, ADHD symptoms. Um, so you want to stay away from those so you limit the amount of reactions that you have in your body. So the importance of water. It's another important element to nutrition and often neglected, uh, especially for Muay Thai athletes, as we always seem to be either squeezing water out of our system uh, through being in the sauna, wearing sweatsuits, um, and even restricting water. So I hope these next slides will give you an idea of the importance of water and just how much dehydration or lack of water affects athlete performance. So the human body is made up of 25% solids and 75% water. So water is a very vital part of the, the human body. What it does, it is it removes toxins from the body. It regulates uh, body temperature. It protects tissues, spinal cord, jo and joints. It removes blood oxygen circulation, or it improves blood oxygen circulation. It affects strength, power, and endurance. Um, and it also affects your mental performance. Your brain is 85% water. So you want to make sure that you're, you're very hydrated, especially during training, during competition. Um, even if you are, are a, a student and you're studying, uh, your performance on your test or even like exams and everything um, will probably improve if you're hydrated while you're, while you're um, doing your test. Um, so the dangers of weight cutting. Uh, Weight cutting can cause stunted growth, improper development of weak, of uh, improper development and weak bones and teeth, hormonal issues, mental health and eating disorders, and stomach problems. Um, I just wanted to take into consideration the the middle three uh, components: uh, improper development and weak bones, hormonal issues, and mental disorders. Um, with respect to female athletes, there's something called the female athlete triad. And um, I want to speak about it because I've experienced this. And even though I was probably in the best shape that I was in, um, I did experience um, loss of periods. I know, guys, um, we don't talk about periods a lot. Um, but I think this is important since our, our sport is a male-dominated sport and some of you are coaches, so I think it's very important that you're aware of the difference between um, male and female bodies. 
So um, what often can happen with respect to females um, is disordered eating, eating behaviors. So this can be in the form of erratic eating behaviors to control body weight, um, poor food choices and skipping meals. Uh, and this can lead to micronutrient deficiencies due to reduced intake of nutrients and energy. As a result of this, um, and also increased activity, like extensive training, uh, oftentimes and often uh, with the effects of stress and low energy availability, ability. so for example, if you have low body fat percentage, this can lead to missed periods, uh, maybe one or two, or even uh, for extensive amounts of time, so a few months. As a result of uh, low periods, this causes, or when somebody loses their periods, um, a female can have low circulating estrogen and this may cause the reduction in calcium retention by the bones and can lead to osteopenia. So this is low bone mass and premature osteoporosis. Um, another, and because of this, this can potentially uh, lead, to, lead to increased risk of stress factor, fractures, um, especially in the spine and the hips. So you want to really make sure that you're aware of this and your athletes are aware of this. Um, I remember when I used to miss my periods, um, I had asked many doctors and um, the response from my doctors was, they asked if I was very athletic or if I was an athlete. I was like, yes I am. And they're like, oh, that's normal. But it's not normal um, and it could lead to osteoporosis um, later on. So you want to make sure that you have enough nutrients in your diet um, and that your body is well taken care of. Um, and if you're, there's too much stress on your body, you want to make sure that there are ways in which you can relieve that stress. Um, also, with respect to athletes in general, um, especially for the youth, um, I think that it's important that um, as athletes, if you're a little bit older and you're role models for youth and you're teaching youth, or if you are um, a coach, um, you want to be aware that eating disorders uh, is prevalent uh, amongst athletes. Um, and you want to make sure that they have enough education to know um, how to take care of their bodies, um, and they're what, that they're well supported. Uh, so as youth, uh, they are trying to gain their confidence. Um, they're at an age where a lot of people's opinion matters. So um, you want to make sure that you, that you give them an environment that's very supportive uh, to prevent this type of uh, eating disorders from happening. So possible explanations for eating disorders include competitive athletic atmosphere, constant pressure to succeed, heightened body awareness, compulsive and compulsiveness and perfection, fluctuation of self-esteem with fluctuation of performance, uh, ability to block pain or hunger, willingness to take unnecessary risks to win, belief that the body leanness optimizes performance, lack of identity beyond sport. Um, so you want to make sure that especially the youth um, have other forms um, of, I guess, pleasure or activity um, that they can turn to. And even though Muay Thai will, will take a lot, a lot of your, your time as an elite athlete, um, you also want to make sure that you have other sources of, I guess, stress relief or um, places that you can grow as well. Um, so the effects of dehydration, um, it can lead to susceptibility to concussion and brain damage, kidney damage, overheating, uh, decreased athletic performance, and death, unfortunately. Um, just so that you're aware, uh, 
and so that we remember. Um, we have to learn from the champions who are no longer with us. So Jordan Cole, he was from Scotland. Uh, he died in 2017 and he was only 20, I believe. And then Jessica Lindsay, she was only 17. And she also died in 2017. And they both died of dehydration. So they were in sweatsuits um, and it was just too much for their bodies and unfortunately they passed away. So again, I want to stress as athletes, we have to be aware of what's good and not good for our bodies. Um, we have to educate our teammates um, and the coaches need to be aware of the effects of um, dehydration, the effects of improper nutrition and because you want to have athletes that are successful and have long lasting careers. So make sure that um, you guys are educated and that, that everybody um, is supported and that you pass on this information to your teammates as well. So I hope that, um, Garnet, are you there? I am here, Janice. I'm just waiting. I'm just listening to all the amazing information you were sending out there. But yes, I'm right here. Okay. Do you want to try and see if your video is working? Let's see. So my apologies, guys, because um, my actual um, camera here or my link isn't working. I don't know if you guys could see me now. Can you guys see me? Is it still uh, getting... Okay, I'm going to stop this live presentation and then it's still a little bit fuzzy. All right. This is what I really look like, guys. <clears throat> I usually come in lines and so on. But um, that being said, what I'll do is for now, just I'm going to turn off the camera. There, I'm getting a bit of, uh, anyway, some disruption in what uh, in terms of video. So don't mind the, the wiggled lines like I'm from uh, a movie. Uh, John Wick I actually looked like Keanu Reeves in real life. I wish, but anyways, <laughs> what I'll do is just turn off the camera so you guys are not distracted, but hopefully um, today we'll be talking about um, uh, how to fix your elbow and shoulder pain, or at least how to uh, have a look at it, um, highlighting what's going on in the elbow and what's going on with the shoulder. But before I go on to my presentation, I just want to say uh, that was really amazing information, Janice, with regards to... Um, all the things that you had mentioned about um, in terms of like fats and even how to eat properly in those times. And um, anyways, I, th I think I just saw it uh, uh, filming for a second. Anyways, <clears throat> but thank you for giving that information regarding um, athletes and what to do in terms of eating and even obviously the latter part of it in terms of obviously if you're not eating right and hydrating properly that it can lead to trauma and just to kind of tie up to this uh, working with Janice and other athletes uh, Thai boxers and soccer players and all kind of other professional sports <clears throat> definitely nutrition is a big part of how they keep themselves balanced and being able to push themselves through and there are those dangers that Janice has uh, mentioned about especially for females uh, losing their their um, like in terms of menstrual menstrual cycle and the big part to that is that especially in your in a sport and it's not about the hitting part of it it's the fact that you are putting your body through a lot of stress is that <clears throat> your bones actually end up becoming brittle not so good when you're checking a chick, uh, checking a kick or, you know what I mean, like blocking. And I've seen in other sports and also in Thai boxing of um, the leg bone or the arm bone uh, being um, fractured, essentially. So hopefully, like, um, you do take in consideration in terms of how to help your fighters and athletes um, at least get in the right course of this. And if you do have any questions obviously janice is actually a holistic certified uh, nutritionist she can definitely help you out or look for professionals in your environment that you can trust to that will guide you to ensure that your athletes uh pursue um the the sport itself in a in longer um duration than just a year or two years so just thanks again for that all right i'm going to move on to my presentation here and i just want to just check 
and we're going to start here. All right. So um, for you guys that don't know who I am, my name is Garnet Santa Cruz. I'm a manual therapist here in Toronto, Canada, and uh, I've been in practice for over 18 years. Um, I've There's a lot of, I guess, initials after the name, but it's not the point. But essentially, I've been working with a lot of athletes, um, active individuals, all the way down to uh, desk jockeys of people that work in the corporate world. Um, but there's all these things that tie it all together for me uh, in terms of what happens to the body. Uh, what you don't use, you lose. And basically, it also applies to what you guys do as, as athletes in terms of repetition. So in repetition causes dysfunction. So if you're not aware of what's going on in your system or your body, then the likelihood of you getting injured will just increase. And you guys are in a sport where there's a lot of impact and contact, and therefore your risk even goes even higher. But you guys didn't go into the sport because you guys are afraid of taking a little hit here and there, right? So that being said, there are things that you can do to help you with your discomforts. And these series that we have, we've basically isolated each joint as much as we can to give you guys an idea, a basic breakdown of what's going on in it and some suggestions. So the next part is just basically A, um, just to let you know that, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, I'm not trying to play one on the internet here. So I would highly suggest uh, that you do seek uh, help um, from someone that you know. Uh, in terms of diagnosis and, and treatment, it's always better to work with, with a, a specialist uh, with regards to this, just to give you the right direction for it. And how, for me, how it works in terms of here in Toronto is that normally a doctor would diagnose the patient um, with whatever it is, shoulder pain, and would get a prescription and a referral to one of us, a physiotherapist, massage therapist, athletic therapist, and so on and so forth. And that's how we would start it off. And then from there, we would create a treatment plan. So it's that, it's pretty much, um, it's not one size fits all when it comes to pain. It, you're trying to understand what happened and what caused it. And usually from there, you have a higher chance of solving the issue with the knowledge base that you, the body, will pick up from hopefully the, the information that we're giving to you guys. So you guys have to advocate for your own health and wellness. And we're just here to basically facilitate or guide you or help you make hopefully the right decisions. And we will not lead you astray because, you know, we don't do this um, for the sake of um, getting you guys to listen to us, but more to listen to your own body. So, so seek medical advice and um, here we go. All right. So the next slide itself is, um, when it finally shows up on your screen here, it's um, basically what is the shoulder. And uh, the shoulder itself, for the most of you guys, hopefully you guys have this, um, is basically the definition of it is that it's um, glenohumeral joint. Uh, it's uh, basically a structural, classified as synovial ball and socket joint, uh, functionally, um, as a diathrosis multi-axial joint. It involves articulation between the glenoid cavity of the scapula and the head of the humerus and arm. Raise your arm if you understood what I just said. If you guys did, you guys get a brownie point. But basically the shoulder is a, is a, a movable joint. It's one of those uh, parts in your arm or in your body that essentially just goes forward, goes sideways, it goes, it rotates, and if you just move around your shoulders when you guys are doing exercise, you can do a lot. And it's a ball and socket, meaning that it actually goes into the space and it turns like a ball, it has many directions. It's very, um, it's susceptible to um, a lot of injuries due to that factor because of one, one, um, attachment point, which is um, the shoulder itself actually attaches right to the uh, front of the chest. So a tiny ligament holds that shoulder, and you probably know this more as the scapula or the shoulder blade, holds it in place. But everything around it, in terms of muscles, are the ones responsible for moving the shoulder itself. So think of a tire or a wheel, and the spokes of a wheel being muscles. If one of those spokes are off by a little bit, the tire goes wonky or it doesn't um, move properly. So the muscles itself in the shoulder, it's 
it's a tough one to fix. It's a tough one to basically deal with. But if we can find out what's going on with the shoulder, uh, either through weakness and testing the weakness in those areas or movement, and then we can figure out a little bit more uh, what to do next and movements. So the movements itself, like what I told you, uh, the variations of it on the next slide, it goes up, it goes to the side, it goes in a circle motion, it, it even rotates in, in different forms in different ways. And uh, basically it has these terms and you've probably heard it before called adduction, abduction, flexion, extension, internal rotation, external rotation, and circumduction. Um, and all that basically means is that it moves many, many things. So you could test it out yourself. Like, how does your shoulder feel like right now? And I know you guys can't see the video, but I'm, I'm moving my shoulder. I want to see what it feels like when I lift it up. Does it, is there discomfort there? Or when I bring it back, is there, you know, you're looking for tightness in those areas. And it's really important to find this out because in terms of punching and kicking, even though we're focusing on the shoulder itself and the elbow, um, you want to see that those movements are smooth as possible because it actually allows the body to either create more of a, um, in terms of impact, in terms of pressure and, and basically power. And at the same time to also retract or bring back the movement to your body to protect yourself. So the faster you're able to do a motion, the better you are or equipped to be able to essentially face your opponent. The elbow itself is, uh, in, is uh, important to connect with the shoulder because when you are, let's say, um, turning your fists to punch or grabbing something that requires you to go from your hand being palm up to palm down, there is going to be some movement or rotation happening at the elbow. Um, for you, for a lot of fighters, I, I don't find a whole lot of like uh, I would say discomfort in the elbow joint for 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 the most parts in terms of injury. It's um, not as much um, in terms of the shoulder, and usually if there is a problem with the el with the elbow, it's usually coming from the shoulder. And, uh, and neck, actually. Uh, the elbow itself, you guys love your elbows. So, you know, it's part of the, the, the science of Muay Thai, of the eight limbs, um, being one of the, the small daggers versus a long sword of a fist um, that allows uh, to give nice cuts to the, the head and chin. So we've seen that a few times of like basically getting those sharp elbows in a face and whatnot. But also just trying to figure out as well to what's going on in the elbow. Um, on the slide here, it says the humerus. It's not about being funny. Sorry, inside joke. And it's um, basically goes into the elbow, which is the radial and the ulna. So the importance of this is essentially radial, like it, it's just location. So the radial head is essentially the one that goes into your thumb. The ulna is the one that goes into your pinky. Okay, so just to kind of get that a little bit of like an idea of how these bones kind of work. And the humerus is the is basically the one that goes into your shoulder blade. And very much so with the elbow itself, it just hinges so um, uh, toward doing a bicep curl and doing a tricep extension. Uh, it's got a little bit of rotation, but the majority of it is that it kind of pivots or rotates along um, the actual uh, elbow joint. And here you go in terms of movement is that it just kind of gives you a bicep curl kind of motion and tricep curl in particular. So the majority of it is flexion and extension. So bicep curl and tricep curl or tricep extension um, or pronation, which is your palm up. And um, oh, sorry, uh, pronation is palm down, supination as if you're holding a soup, um, palm up. So just think of that in terms of when you're doing a punch properly, you are going from supination to pronation or palms up to palms down to create a bigger impact or drilling effect into punching that person. Or you can go nice and flat and do Mike, Mike Tyson uh, 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 hitting, the, hitting the chin. But we'll get to that in the next uh, webinar in terms of hitting properly. All right. So a lot of these... In terms of these webinars, I'm always going back to the spine because the spine itself causes a lot of problems down the limbs. And essentially, the spine itself houses or contains a lot of nerves that are feeding into 
the actual hands and the actual feet and knees and hips. So when those areas are restricted, it has a cascading effect or it goes down from the neck to the shoulder, to the elbow, to the wrist, to even the fingers. So for some people that have ever had experience of numbness and tingling um, down their hand, it might be just in their thumb and pointing finger or their pinky and those other three fingers beside it, two fingers beside it. It's usually a result of something being pinched. So just think of it as like a highway or a road in terms of the spine, and there's a lot of congestion or there's a car accident. So when there's a car accident, the whole system slows down and you can't get to there as fast. So information from the spine into your hands really requires things that are unblocked. So neutralize your spine. And going back to this very funny diagram, and which you'll see shortly, is that the many different positions that we tend to get into in terms of our spine. Um, a lot of, like in terms of the, 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 the positions here, these are some of the things that you guys have done. And it's uh, the first one with the sway back is uh, just think of it as this missing a punch or a kick. And I know your stance is never like this in terms of uh, um, feet together like that, but you may or may not. We'll see. Um, and then basically taunting the guy with the lumbar lordosis. And now all that is is that your lower back has a bit more of a curve, um, thoracic kyphosis, and essentially your ribs are forward a bit. I often look at Sun Chai as this, this kind of um, uh, positioning of the spine because of just all the different variations he has. And I tend to go back to Sanchai all the time because I just feel like his posture is so um, superior compared to a lot of fighters because he's able to stay upright and uh, he has a lot of dexterity in the spine itself to move it. And for the most part, so if you guys go on his YouTube or his IG uh, channel, you'll see how good of a posture he has. And I'm not trying to knock any other fighters, just that it's just in my kind of eyes, I see his movement as something that is superior, whether that's coming from a boxing background or some other martial arts that he did prior to Muay Thai. But essentially, his spine is great. And I'm sure he has injuries, just that I don't see it lingering as long as it should. And I have never met him, and maybe one day I will, through these talks uh, about his uh, posture and just how he maintains his body. Because that would be an interesting conversation to have. I'll need Janice, though, to translate everything for me by just giving you a heads up. The next slide is just showing you in terms of what can cause a, a poor spine, um, whether it be a headache or shoulder pain or back pain or knee pain or discomfort in your feet. So positioning of your spine is really key to uh, making sure that you are feeding the right information into our hands and limbs and just making sure that you guys know about this as well to um you know on the on the chat box if you can um if you've ever had numbness and tingling in your arm give me a thumbs up if it's possible to go on this on this uh, uh chat box here thumbs up in terms of all that or lower back pain give me a thumbs up which you know can cause a lot of discomfort when you're training. So if you've ever had discomfort in your lower back, it doesn't always have to be the lower back. It could be your foot being a little bit off. Maybe you kick something and it's causing your foot to not plant on the ground properly, which causes the hips to be a little bit uh, off kilter or out of balance. You've had neck pain or shoulder pain. Okay. Um, maybe your hip got hit or someone, you know, drop something on your left hip that can cause discomfort and pain, which now makes the hip not move, uh, not as, as movable as possible. That can cause your neck and shoulders to do a lot of the movements that your hip normally does. Everything is connected. Just remember that. So what happens to your feet happens to your hands. What happens to your head happens to your knee. So it's essential to make sure that you, check up from toe to head what is going on before you even train to make sure that you can at least push it as hard as you can when those training times do occur. Locating the pain is important 
And um, in terms of shoulder and elbow pain, a lot of discomforts usually arise in the front of the shoulder. And the, the reason for that usually is because of uh, either chest uh, muscles tightening up or posture once again, uh, when you have a humpback kind of positioning. And in Thai box, I tend to see a little bit more of, of um, a humpback, your, sh your shoulders coming forward because of just the stance in particular. Just that in time, it can cause discomfort in the shoulder and pain. And it'll squish or pinch the nerves in front of it. So if your chest is tight, there's a nerve that goes all the way into your, like, your arm that is behind the chest muscles, and that can cause pinching. It's called the brachial plexus, pinching into your arm itself. So that's one of the things that can usually cause discomfort. It could also come from something being a little bit loose or damaged into the shoulder. And essentially, if something is not supposed to be there, the shoulder now has to move or articulate differently. So on this next slide here, you'll see some white stuff around the actual bone itself. So the surrounding area is muscle. It looks like meat. It looks like deli meat, actually. It looks like a piece of ham. And then you have the circle in the, in the top there. And that's, that's the shoulder bone itself. So that's the humerus. So the humerus itself surrounding that particular space, there's white stuff all around it. So those white stuff there, and even the one at the top right corner of that humerus or that bone, um, essentially has something kind of coming into the bone itself. So to me, when I'm looking at that, there is either um, inflammation or a piece of tissue that is now into that shoulder. Now for these situations, obviously if there is something that's not supposed to be in there, the chances are, um, surgery will happen later on to either scope, remove those spaces. So once again, I'm not a doctor. These are the kind of things that I see when patients bring in their, their x-rays. And um, essentially, you can, at least for the most part, help those muscles, even if you do have to perform surgery, um, by doing exercises to strengthen the joint itself. Because most of the times, muscles are the ones responsible for fine-tuning the movement. So as long as you can keep the muscle around that shoulder strong, the chances of you delaying the shoulder from performing surgery, and at times, some people actually heal from this and um, essentially will have a stronger, uh, like, I guess, not a guess, but a stronger chance of you not being uh, injured with this, um, with, with your training uh, with having shoulder injury. And posture is going to be the biggest thing. And, you know, I already told you guys earlier in terms of neutralizing the spine. And it does affect a lot of, of uh, what's going on in the body itself, especially in the shoulder and elbow. So you just got to fix your posture. I mean, and this goes, it extends out not just to athletes, but to your kids. Um, have you, if you guys have ever noticed, like, I mean, what, the way kids carry their backpack, it's because it's heavy most of the times. Um, and their head will tend to kind of come forward, which causes the pinching once again in the chest there area. And the difference is obviously um, the bag being placed differently and knowing where the weight is in terms of leverage is also key. So what this kid has able is, is showing you guys is that things are aligned. His ear is over his shoulder, his shoulder is over his hip, his hip is over his knees. Can't see it, but it's just proper posture. Will they listen? I don't know. Uh, but just make an attempt for it because it definitely helps them later on in life and also us as adults to get rid of some of our pain just by fixing your spine, okay? When does it hurt is also key and important with regards to this. And um, it's essentially, does it hurt during rest? Does it ache? Does it hurt when you're moving? Does it hurt when... You know, you're not doing anything. Does it hurt when you lift up your arm? So knowing when it hurts is also important in trying to figure out how to fix, how to treat the actual symptom itself. It usually, if it hurts um, when you're resting, there might be, I mean, once again, you just have to check with your doctor. Uh, early arthritis can happen. Um, it could be um, 
muscle tear, it could be ligament tear, it could be micro tearing itself from training itself. Um, and usually with micro tearing or small kind of increments of change in the muscle is that it's because of training itself and it will heal up about, you know, um, about five to six weeks. But with ligament and tendon, they take a lot longer to heal, like six to nine months. It takes a long time for ligaments to heal. So just if something is nagging, chronic, um, you've had it for over three to six months, that's something that you definitely want to make sure that you're not trying to kind of push aside and be like, oh, heal itself. You definitely have to make sure that you are um, seeking advice at that point just to make sure that it doesn't become any worse because it'll compensate in time and it'll be just more work later on for you. So that's why. The seminar is hopefully going to give you some insight in terms of how to treat it now with certain exercises that you can do. Um, so I wanted to, I'm missing a slide here, my apologies. So it's actually going into the next uh, few exercises that I that you do need to help you with the shoulder. And uh, the variation is uh, a push-up, right? So the push-up itself, helps with shoulder pain because of just the different angles that it has. So if you have shoulder pain, and obviously if you're doing like a wide push-up and that causes you pain, change it. Um, the, if you do a diamond push-up, which is your hands are closer together and you're using more triceps muscle and that's fine, then kind of work that out in that muscle for now or that, that type of movement. Um, a lot of these exercises will give you uh, a template or – you know, instructions in terms of, you know, 10 to 15 reps for three sets and holding it for 30 to a minute in terms of uh, holding patterns. Um, I tend to basically, when I train my clients, is that I look at in terms of body language and I see what's going on with their, like, you know, their, their neck and their shoulder and things that are imbalanced when I'm looking for rehabilitative. I'm trying to see if they're pushing more in the right arm or the left arm. Are they cheating athletes' um, bodies in terms of muscle and movement? They cheat very easily. And the reason being for that is that you, when you have an elite body, they can acquire or use different muscle groups to do the exact same thing. The problem with that is that you're now changing the lines of movement in that body, and it's not going to be as effective. If uh, as effective as what your body's supposed to do. So one of the things that you can do to help with your body in terms of shoulder pain is doing some push-ups and seeing what it does for you. Does it hurt? Obviously, if it hurts, then, then you have to skip this one in terms of exercise for now and move on to the next one. And basically, another movement that can cause a lot of shoulder pain and elbow pain is also external rotation. So the next um, slide is somebody who is about to throw a ball and there is a lot of force uh, that is needed to do an external rotation or to turn it outwards and to throw that motion. So there's a lot of, if you just look at the movements here, um, if I was to break this down as a therapist and as a, as a trainer, I would look at, what is happening here and what I see right now is that this person just used the front of his legs to slow himself down. His arm is going backwards, but at the same time, I know that there's going to be a twisting motion in which his foot plants goes all the way up towards his groin, towards his abdominal muscles, towards his arm, along with his rotator cuff, turning out slightly, and then he throws it. Did I lose you guys? That is a kinetic chain itself. So nothing is isolated. It doesn't matter if you're punching or kicking. It comes from the ground up to be able to exert or to push that, that momentum to do what you need to do. But at the same time, you also have to be able to bring it back as quickly as possible so that you can reset. So there's many ways to injure yourself. Finding your weakness is, is part of this because of the fact that if you don't know what it is that you're weak at, then how are you going to solve it? How are you going to fix it? And um, there is importance in terms of specialization. Maybe you're a head kicker or maybe you're good with your elbows, you're good with your punches. But in time, you know that you will get spotted by another fighter that is better than you in terms of whatever it is that they do. And they'll expose your weakness. So find your weakness now. You don't have to be 100% the greatest at it, 
but at least know what it is when someone is trying to um, use this weakness on you so that they can win. So find your weakness now, work on it, and then hone in on the skill, be aware, and then hopefully you build yourself up in these areas of weakness that is now going to be strengths later on. I know we're running a little bit, uh, uh, basically, um, I'm just trying to speed it up here. Sorry, guys. I don't mean to be speeding through the, some of these um, um, slides, but we're kind of running out one uh, one hour of time, and I want to be respectful of your time. So the next one is muscles of the shoulder and elbow. Um, we, you know, there's the, the main one for the, the shoulder muscles itself are the rotator cuffs um, that often gets injured in the shoulder itself. And the one I find the most injured is the supraspinatus, which is at the top of the shoulder, shoulder blade. And I told you guys earlier in terms of the chest muscles, um, tightening up in those the front muscles uh, called pec minor, which is the one that is attached or connected to the shoulder, is usually combined with injury because it ends up pinching the shoulder itself, causing a lot of uh, disruption in the arm itself. We have to essentially make sure that um, we are building ourselves up to become stronger and more effective in these exercises is probably what I want you to walk away with in this presentation. And the thing is with the shoulder is that it can do a lot of things, a lot of motions, but yet we tend to limit it to one type of motion. So for you guys that are athletes or trainers in particular, there's going to be a certain motion that you guys do over and over and over and over again. There's a saying that I'd be afraid of the person that um, um, practices one kick a thousand times versus a person that practices a thousand kicks. So I understand the whole um, being a specialist in something, but find the range of motion in that actual shoulder or knee or hip so that you can at least um, even change it when you need to. So finding your weakness to become stronger. And the next exercises I'm gonna show you guys are some of the top four that I tend to uh, basically prescribe or give to people when they are coming in with shoulder discomfort. And a lot of these things is that um, neck and shoulder discomfort tends to be because of just a misalignment in the actual spine itself. And I told you guys earlier, I'm going back to this again, and I don't need to sound like a broken record, but neutralizing your spine is key. So if you do find yourself leaning forward too much, looking at the computer right now as you're trying to read, um, it's the same thing. It's just going to cause some discomfort in time. So don't train your body for bad posture. Train it for good posture, train it for good training, train it for good nutrition, like what we're trying to present here. And last but not least, the, um, just to give you guys as a walk away, and these videos, by the way, uh, I don't know if you guys know, are being recorded. So if you um, would like to go back to these things, we'll send them out to you to just follow through and at least be able to give you guys some insight as well if there's something that, you know, it's, a, it's an hour long. So if you guys didn't uh, catch something, you could always rewind. And on the chat box, I said, if you guys have any questions, just feel free to email one of us and we'll answer you guys the best of our capability, obviously. Um, and in these times, like it's so easy now to connect through Zoom or WhatsApp or other versions of this. And the exercises that I'm giving to you guys or showing you guys are the ones that I'm, I tend to give to my clients and patients. So just um, read along as you um, as much as possible for the next ones here. Bird dog is the first one I would suggest with uh, someone with neck and shoulder pain. And um, essentially all that is, and you'll see on the next uh, um, slide, is that lifting your left arm and your right leg in a almost plank position to start off with, and just you're alternating with this motion. The beauty about this, in terms of proper bird dog position, is that you're once again you are giving the spine something to work with by giving it an imbalance, and at the same time, just make sure you're maintaining proper new, uh, spine position of the neck and shoulders. I know all in time this actually helps with getting some of the muscles, uh, some of the muscles, but the muscles in the lower back and hip to um, 
to go in movement with the shoulder itself. So it's not just about isolating the shoulder to fix it. You also have to work with the whole spine so that it strengthens the whole system. So the bird dog is key. I, Y's, and T's are the next one. And essentially, just look at the, the, the guy in the front and the bottom part here in terms of what an I looks like, a Y looks like, and a T looks like. And the person on the floor here um, will show you positioning on the, on, on the lines here. So as you can see, he's lying face down on, the stu on, on his stomach. And at this point, what he should be doing is just lifting it up towards the ceiling if he's on the floor. Another variation of this, um, does that make sense for anyone in terms of this exercise itself? Is just you're laying face down, you're lifting your arm up as high as you can without trying to lift your chest off the floor. So true movement here comes from the shoulder. It doesn't come from your lower back, which athletes will, not just athletes, people will try to cheat to get that arm up. So this is how you can tell someone's weakness and also their strength once you find that weakness to get them to do these ranges of motion in this one. And this one itself is really effective with trying to battle or help with the rotator cuff. Really key guys, I, Y's and T's are the ones that you can do for this one. Highly suggested. I know you guys are strong. I know you guys can do a thousand pushups. I know you guys can kick the bag a million times, but how many of you guys are actually doing chin-ups or pull-ups? Well, Chin-ups and pull-ups are key to neutralizing the tightness in your chest, tightness in your neck, the tightness in your front of your arm and shoulders. The reason being for that is that you are now using the antagonist or the opposite uh, muscles that you often use for punching, and kicking, and so on, and using the muscles that slow down the movement. So your back muscles or your shoulder muscles in the back uh, your rhomboids, your lower traps, your uh, middle traps, these other uh, muscles that you probably have heard of, they need to act as brakes for your body. And essentially what allows you to bring back your hand into position or your feet into position. So you're bringing it back with regards to this motion. So chin-ups and pull-ups are, are also should be a staple for training, uh, which a lot, of, a lot of fighters I find don't do enough of but I would definitely use this to help with shoulder pain and discomfort. So once again, with this one, it's, um, you know, there's, there's a formula to it. If you, if you um, want to follow that and um, you know, about 10 to 15 for three sets. And um, obviously with regards to it, it really depends on the athlete or the person that's doing this because maybe 10 to 15 is a little bit too easy. There's variations that you can use such as this gentleman right here is using weights on his hips. Um, a little bit more advanced, just adding a little bit more weight for this. And obviously, if you are trying to bulk up or strengthen those muscles a little bit more, uh, the force of the weight itself will cause the muscles to um, essentially uh, become hypertrophy or get bigger because of that. Um, I don't recommend like big muscles for a lot of like martial artists because of the fact that it just it slows you down a little bit more. But in terms of rehab, sometimes certain muscle groups are so weak that you need to add a little bit more weight to that space. Or if it's already hard enough to begin with your own body weight, just do that. But chin-ups are really great for uh, making sure your shoulders are bulletproof. This is a fairly new one in terms of like training in particular called hammer drills, which is um, just, you know, ham hammering into a tire. Um, so just just to make sure that your shoulders aren't like, killing you all the time. And, um, but the hammering motion really gets the full range of motion for the shoulder. So if you think about circumduction or circling the actual joint, this requires you to use a lot of your body, your trunk, into that motion in particular. Um, I would do variations of hammer drills. There's ones coming from the side, and then there's ones that you can essentially um, get from behind you, like as if you're taking a sword out of your back and doing that motion, and also the other side, just changing the different angles to make sure that you're creating symmetry. So a little bit more advanced for this one. You don't always have, you don't have to use a hammer to do this motion. You can either use a, a tubing or just maybe your own weight for the time being if, it is, if there's some pain in it. 
And essentially, general rule of thumb for training is that you want to start off with your own body weight first or just gravity itself, and then move on to something a little bit more forceful, like a hammer and so on and so forth. But it really comes down to the movement of the shoulder and trying to get um, all the um, the, uh, the you're checking all the movements that you're good in or that you're good for that and essentially strengthening it as you proceed. And if you want to get to the next level, as you guys have done in your careers, you either put more force, more work, and so on and so forth. And basically, those are my suggestions in terms of uh, what you can do for shoulder discomfort. And that being said, that is the end of this presentation. And we are now moving into... Um, question and answering. So Janice, can you come back on when, when you're ready? Hello. Hey. <laughs> Thank you so much, Garnet. That was really informative. I think my shoulders are one of the ones that are, my shoulders often suffer the most mm -hmm. because they're often really tense and I have really bad posture. So <laughs> Thank you for that. No worries. <laughs> so um, uh, we have one question from Austin. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, hi, Garnet. Yep. Muay Thai training tends to be pushing pattern dominant, mm -hmm. which will be the correct or ratio between pulling and pushing to avoid imbalances. All right. So, yes, you're 100% right. And I don't know if my uh, – I just turned on my camera here. Hopefully you guys can see me here. But I am uh, not John Wick. And uh, anyways, so Oscar <laughs> – Thanks for uh, responding to this. And uh, basically, with regards to training for Muay Thai, you're right. It's, a lot of it is pushing. And that is probably, it's not a problem, but a lot of the, the movements that end up causing pain is a repetition of movement because of that. So you definitely want to make sure that the ratio for this is you're looking at about two to one. Um, it's a breaking system when you're using... Um, uh, pullbacks and and uh, uh, anything that basically requires you to bring your your hand towards your chest. I would I would often like look at it as well too, like in terms of finding your weakness. Once you do find your weakness, the two to one ratio um, flips in terms of now making sure that you are doubling the exercise on say the back and lessening the exercise in the front, so you don't lose a lot of the muscle memory that you guys have have. Um, um, done over training in particular um, it's it comes down to testing and pain is just uh, is is there to teach us uh, that something is wrong and embrace the pain to, I always tell my clients and it's not about uh, pushing through the pain but just letting that be kind of a way to teach you to or to notify you that something is a little bit messed up so Hopefully you learned or saw like in terms of movements there of what the shoulder can do. And it's a matter of just trying to get the, the motion in that angle and to see if there's pain in it. So once you find that, what, you, what you'll often see is that like certain movements will take away the discomfort. Um, one of the things that for shoulder pain I tend to do with people is like, okay, turn your head to the left, turn your head to the right, look up, look down. Does that take away some of the discomfort? So it, it really comes down to like what's causing the shoulder pain uh, when you're dealing with this stuff and then kind of prescribing what is needed to that person so that you can strengthen it. Um, but I would say two to one um, with the ratio that you're asking for the first part in terms of uh, reducing dominance. If it's, um, if there's no pain, two to one, you know, you guys have to basically punch, you guys have to kick, you have to go forward with regards to it. But keep in mind that you're, when you're punching, you are also decelerating or using a brake system, which is your back muscles or your hamstring muscles to, to essentially slow down that process. And those muscles are important for bringing it backwards uh, when that happens. And hopefully that, uh, that makes sense as I, as I uh, explain this. Does that make sense? Uh, he says two for the antagonist or one for the antagonist? Uh, he's got agonist one for that. Yes. So two for if it's if there's pains, it's a two antagonist and then one agonist. So for you guys, in terms of um, what antagonist and agonist is, is that basic antagonist is anti, so uh, against it, and uh, agonist is usually um, uh, for it. So the chest is an agonist muscle if you're punching, and um, 
their back muscles as, as an antagonist. Another uh, way to also uh, understand what antagonist and agonist is or agonist and antagonist is, is that like your bicep muscle in particular um, or your quadricep muscle, this would make it easier for you guys. So the front of your thigh muscle, that's an agonist muscle for bringing your knee up, kneeing somebody. The antagonist of that is going to be your hamstring muscle, so behind it. And that's why the ratio for the leg muscles is that four to two. So you have four quadriceps muscle and two biceps femoris or hamstring muscle. So that, that question you had, Oscar, is actually, it's, it's in the body. Science of the body is two to one when it comes down to it. So the one that needs uh, more musculature will often have a two to one ratio. Hope that helps, Oscar. Um, so the, so um, I just want to answer this part here, Janice. Uh, Ruhula Esrat. Uh, hi, Ruhula. Hopefully you're still on there. And you mentioned you have lower back pain. Um, with And I know we actually did a seminar or a, a video, a YouTube video, or part of a webinar here for lower back pain. Right, Janice? And um, yes. I would definitely look that up uh just rewind the time here. Just go on, go on the YouTube channel it's, as well that Janice has uh, given, uh, put out there to find out more about lower back pain and what you can do for that. Um, but just to just give you a little snippet for lower back pain, um, and it's sometimes with the tight hip flexors from doing a lot of the ab exercises can cause that. And essentially lower back pain itself um, can also be due to the hip joints being stuck um, and there's some exercises that we uh, highlighted for that part. So I would highly, highly recommend checking out that YouTube video. And if you know anybody that's suffering this, just send it to them as well. And the premise or the idea behind these webinars, Janice, right, is to, um, it's not about athletes, it's for everybody. And um, obviously you guys being athletes or training, trainers of athletes, you guys are a little bit more advanced in, in terms of body movement, nutrition, and so on and so forth but definitely is still helpful for anyone else that is suffering these situations. Uh, Ruhula, for your question, or I think there was connection problems, so I apologize for that. Um, all of the presentations are recorded um, and they are uploaded onto the IFMA YouTube channel. Um, so we will upload this video for you. Are there any more questions that anybody has regarding nutrition or um, shoulder and elbow pain? And again, apologies on uh, the timing of this. Uh, it's supposed to be an hour, but we think we went over time. It's a lot to cover with all the nutrition and uh, shoulder and <laughs> yeah. elbow. It's probably the longest we've had, <laughs> if you think about it, in terms of presentation. The, like at that, you know, there's just a lot of things to deal with and talk about in terms of, of uh, each joint, as you can see. And it's not a one-time fix is probably what I want to tell everybody as well in terms of like seeking somebody who's got magical powers um, that will that will fix you is not – I'm sure – I mean, maybe it happens, um, but I would say it's a process. It's like anyone else that's ever trained for anything. You didn't become a great fighter or a good enough fighter to fight in the international level by punching once. So it's, it's key to have uh, the right amount, right people to surround you to make sure that you are heading in the right directions and touching base with uh, uh, mind space or your, you know, mindset in particular that Janice was talking about in terms of like, you know, um, a lot of these situations that happen, uh, whether it be uh, through women cycled to um, a lot of the pressure that we have by our, our athletes or our parents or trainers, um, all these things come together when that person is in the ring fighting by themselves. So it's really important that that person, before that person goes in there, has at least had the, uh, the best um, – team to support him or her to to basically win the fight because at the end of the day it's them no one else that's on that ring but they do bring whatever you guys have given them as fighters representing 
your skill settings in that time frame. So the responsibility is up to us, the support workers, the support team, um, to ensure that our athletes are going in there as healthy and strong as possible. Because if we're just looking at this from a short-term win, then it doesn't make sense. We have to look at this from the long-term vision of such things as Janice is a perfect example of this, of being an athlete uh, and now being one of the chair at IFMA. So there is room to grow in this field, and it doesn't always have to be in the ring. So let's educate. Let's uh, you know, let's make sure that our fighters are not just fighters in the ring, but also fighters for human rights, fighters for the right things in life, and good people, right? So, anything else to add, Janice? As I went through my Oprah moment there. <laughs> Um, no, but uh, thank you everybody for attending. We have um, some executives of IFMA who attended, um, so it's really nice to see um, people from the top who um, are very interested in athlete health and, in, and can um, share this information with their athletes and also their coaches. Um, so thank you for attending. Um, Oscar, you did uh, your question or not a question, but um, you requested that we have a neck focus for the next webinar. So we have two more webinars. Uh, the next one will be uh, September 30th um, and it will be wrist and hand. And then the last one will be focused on spine. So I think Garnick, you're gonna focus on the neck too with respect to that. Yeah, it's part of the spine. So the, the that definitely, um, you have to wait uh, Oscar for the, for the sixth <laughs> one. So you have to, um, wait for that part itself, but it's all part of, um, um, once again, trying to ensure that your body's good, got to make sure your spine is good as well, too. So with regards mm -hmm. to neck, we'll definitely touch base with regards to that, and uh, there'll be some reference to the spine once again um, when we're talking about wrists and, um, and, and elbows, uh, wrists and hands in particular, okay? So look out for that. These webinars every two weeks. Um, so yeah, make sure you include them in your schedule and we'll try and uh, remind you uh, more in advance for the next two. Um, Oscar is the General Secretary of Mexico and they've been doing really great work in uh, making sure that their athletes are, are active and giving them the information and education that they need to, to be healthy. So thank you, especially Oscar for attending. Muchas gracias, Oscar. <laughs> poquito español. Muy poquito español. Um, so, yeah, I mean, if you guys like what you guys have heard or seen, um, just link, uh, send it to your athletes or uh, connect us in terms of Instagram. Um, uh, Janice's uh, tag for Instagram is champion lover and uh, along with uh, IFMA athletes. Mine is uh, either Garnet Santa Cruz on Instagram or Moa Living. Moa Living is a, is a clinic that I run here in Toronto uh, in which we do a lot of these types of um, treatments and consultation with people either online or on site. Um, so if, if you do need some help with regards to that, just tag us on there. If you have any questions, you can easily link with us either through, um, what's your uh, email address, uh, Janice? I'm gonna pull it up. Um, just give me a second, I had it in the slide. Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you all have any questions regarding um, any of the uh, webinars that we've done, either this one or in the past, we'll be really happy to answer any questions and try to help you help to guide you in the right direction. Yeah, as you're pulling that up, I just want to say thank you to Teruhula, um, Oscar, of course, Panajotis, and Duran, Militin, uh, for joining us today. Really. It's been an amazing run so far of being able to connect with so many different uh, countries right now, from Netherlands to Afghanistan to Greece to Mexico to Montenegro. This has just been amazing in terms of being able to connect with all you guys here. So um, hopefully what we're doing today and for the past uh, 
oh, how many months now, Janice, since the pandemic started, um, is there yeah. to help you guys out. And hopefully if you guys do love the content or like the content, uh, subscribe, like it, send it out. Um, and essentially just, you know, it's not for us. It's more for individuals that are out there that need a little bit more help and may not necessarily have this access because of where they're at in, in, in the world or in life in particular. So please do share uh, the best that you can. Yes, and um, I know that language is an issue for a lot of countries, um, and we hope to kind of cut out or cut the, the most important parts of the videos um, into, like, little clips, and hopefully we can get some translation, so we'll have more translation and education for your athletes in your country, in your language. Right. Um, so if you would like that, uh, let me know, and um, I can be sure to to get that going with respect to um, yeah. Yeah. having it in another way. <laughs> yeah, we we really, we really um, require depend on you guys voting uh, what type of language or at least what else you guys can uh, um, give us as a as a way to like what can we uh, do better or how can we make this a little bit more transferable to you guys and if you guys aren't asking then we don't know so doesn't doesn't um, can't be afraid to ask as you guys are all I'm sure have a lot of fire to begin with so just ask just let us know and uh, we'll do the best that we can to make sure that you guys have access to these things in the future um, but also like what I said just um, the more votes we get from you guys the better we understand um, how we can do this so all right guys thank you so much for uh, joining us today muchas gracias uh, what else? Grazie. Uh, what else? I know. Salamat. Um, uh, and other languages that are out there. Um, um, thank you for joining us. And in the spirit of Muay Thai and Thailand. <laughs> thank you. All right. Take care, guys. Have a great day, great night. Uh, and I'll see you guys on the next um, presentation. Thank you, guys. Stay safe. Yep. Be okay. strong. Stay safe. Be strong. <laughs> All right. Talk to you guys soon. Bye. Take care.